stop. There are some things I want you to know before you get into conic sections. And this is going to be some of that fundamental knowledge that I think all students need to know um, before we actually get into the curriculum of learning conic sections. And the reason why I think these pieces of information is important because I've seen so many students that have struggled um, learning conic sections is because they forgot this essential pieces of knowledge. So in this video, I want to cover some um, very, very important pieces of information, some formulas that I think all students need to know to be successful in conic sections. Now, obviously, once you get into conic sections, you're going to be going over the stuff. But I think it's always good to have a leg up on your competition um, to be like, oh, yeah, I already reviewed this stuff. Like, I'm kind of good to go. It's a good thing to know walking into your first lesson that you've already kind of reviewed. You've already kind of prepared for the lesson. So that's why I like this video, and that's why I'm making it for you. So the first thing I want all students to remember is going to be the midpoint formula. So just remember the midpoint formula is going to be finding the midpoint between two coordinate points, right? X1, Y1, and X2, Y2. Um, the nice thing here about conic sections is we don't actually need to like graph it and like figure that. We just need to kind of remember this formula so we can find that middle point, right? And all we're simply doing is finding the average of our X coordinates and the average to between our Y coordinates. So let's go and take a look at an example here. Um, so therefore we can see, you know, how to find the midpoint. All right, so the first thing we're going to want to do in a problem like this is just kind of like understand like, all right, here's a corner point and here's another corner point. Now you could graph them if you wanted to, but I always like to just kind of like label them as an X1, um, Y1 and an X2, a Y2. And then basically all we're going to do is now just plug them into the um, into this formula, right? So I'm basically having negative three plus four, which is my X2, and I'm going to divide that by two. And then over here, I'm going to have a six plus a negative four. Now, again, whenever I'm using negatives, a lot of times, at least afterwards, I always like to use those parentheses so I don't make sure that I make a mistake there. Because um, a lot of times, if we just put the negative, you might just think it's, you know, I don't know. Um, sometimes we can get tripped up here by forgetting to make it like a double negative or anything like that. So in this case, I have negative three plus four, which is going to be a positive one. Positive one divided by two is just going to leave me with a one half. Okay, and six plus negative two is go or six plus negative four is going to be a positive two, and then two divided by two is going to be a one. So therefore, the midpoint, um, the point that's exactly in the middle between x and y, is going to be the point a one half comma one. All right, now the next thing that is very similar to the midpoint formula, and typically in geometry class, once you've learned the midpoint formula, you usually go into this next formula, which is going to be the distance formula. Very, very similar. You can see how the points are kind of, you know, created the same way. We have x2 and our x1 and we y2 and our y2, y1. Again, those are going to come from the coordinate points. But rather than trying to find the middle between the two points, we're now going to be looking for the distance between the two points. And sometimes this can be tricky when we're like, when we have something like on a coordinate plane, it's not going to be, you know, a nice horizontal or vertical line, right? It's going to be on a diagonal. So that's why this distance formula um, can be so helpful. So let's go and again, let's take a look at uh, doing an example. And let's see. Um, how we can just apply it and basically just plug it into the formula to go ahead and simplify. Okay, so again, we just have two points. We don't need to graph them, right? But I think it is important to, you know, kind of remember to just label them and just remember like I have the X1 with the Y ones and I have the X2 with the Y2, right? So again, those are going to be um, putting together. And now I'm simply just going to plug them into the distance formula and plug and chug. Now the midpoint formula, a lot of times some students will forget it. And that's kind of like the big thing I, I like to review with it. But as far as the math goes, you're just adding and subtracting like positive negative numbers and dividing by two. It's not really that difficult. However, with the distance formula, a lot of students make, um, make mistakes because they are subtracting, we're squaring, we have the square root, we're simplifying radicals, like there's a lot that can go wrong here. So I'd really want you to make sure you're being very careful with your parentheses as well as doing the operations. So in this case, we're going to do x2, so it's be 3 minus a negative 1. And again, remember how I mentioned that using the parentheses um, in that last example? This is really, really important here. Um, so we have 3 minus a negative 1 squared, and therefore it's plus now a y2, so it's a negative 2 minus a y1. Okay, so now let's go ahead and simplify this. So remember when you have a double negative, like 3 minus a negative 1 is really like 3 plus 1, so therefore that's going to be 4. And a 4 squared is going to equal to a 16. And then over here, um, I'm going to have a negative 2 minus uh, 3, which is going to be negative 5. Negative 5 squared, though, right? Negative 5 times negative 5 is just going to be a positive 25. 
Okay, so now I have the distance here is going to equal to the square root of 41. Now, again, you could go ahead and approximate this, but I will let you know, like a lot of times in conic sections, we're going to leave things in um, a rat in this radical form. So we're not going to approximate it into a decimal. We will simplify them, but that's going to be something coming up later in the video. All right, up to number three, ladies and gentlemen, is going to be completing the square. So completing the square is going to take a very, very important role in conic sections in this chapter because for when quad and when we're learning quadratics or you're learning how to graph, we recognize that graphing a quadratic using vertex form is very important. That's why the idea of completing the square to go from standard form to vertex form was so helpful. Well, for conic sections, it's even more important because we're going to do something called general form into our conic sections kind of standard form, which is very similar to the quadratic um, vertex form. So we're going to be completing the square quite a bit in the chapter. So it's going to be really, really important that we can remember what exactly we're doing. So let's go and go right into an example here. Now in this example, all I'm simply going to do is just go ahead and rewrite this into vertex form. So um, what we're simply going to do, remember, take our middle term, right? That's going to be the coefficient of your linear term or the middle term here, and that's going to be your b. So you're going to take your b divided by 2, now square it. Now again, remember, you can only do that when your a is equal to 1, right? But we'll get into more examples. I just want to kind of refresh you on this one. So you'll take a 10 divided by 2, quine squared. 10 divided by 2 is 5. 5 squared is equal to a 25. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to add that 20 25 to our quadratic and our linear term. So now our equation is going to look like this. y is equal to a x squared plus a 10x plus a 25. So now what we just did is we created what we call a perfect square trinomial x squared plus 10x plus 25 is a perfect square trinomial. All right, that can be factored down into what we call a binomial squared. The problem with just adding a 25 to that is you can't do that, right? You have to either add a 25 to both sides or you add and subtract the 25 on the same side. So we have to make sure whenever you add that 25, you also have to make sure you subtract it, okay? So add it inside the parentheses and then subtract it outside. Now here, the nice thing about having perfect square trinomials is we can factor this down. So that's gonna mean x plus five, quine squared, and then here we have 24 minus 1, which is going to be a negative 1. Well, now, guys, we have this in vertex form, and remember, if you needed to find, like, the vertex, right, that's going to be a negative 5 comma negative 1, all right? So just a quick little remember, uh, reminder of how to find the vertex when you are using completing the square. Now, once you know how to complete the square, it's going to be really important also to remember, like, we need to remember how to graph a quadratic. Okay, so um, graphing a quadratic, there can be a lot of ways we can do this. And one thing I always tell students is like, you can always refer back to a table, right? And again, sometimes you might get stuck in conic sections where you'd want to use like a table of values, like values for X to get Y, values of Y to get X. Um, but, you know, I think a lot of times we're just going to be using our general form. I think it's important to understand like the transformations um, from vertex form. And that's what I really want to kind of carry over from your understanding of quadratics into your conic sections. So when we want to like graph a quadratic, let's just kind of go through an example here. Okay, so the main thing we need to do is first identify the vertex, which you can say in this one, um, our vertex here is going to be a positive three, negative one, right? And then we need to understand if there's any transformations. Now, obviously we could have like stretches and compressions, but there's something big that's also we notice here is when we multiply by negative, right? That's going to be flipping the graph about the x-axis. So what we're gonna say is reflect the x-axis, okay? So that's gonna be a very big one here um, that we're gonna have there. Now, again, we need to understand like the parent graph, right? And one thing we'll talk about in conic sections is all the different types of like, you know, parent graphs for all the conics that we're going to be dealing with. Um, but again, the parabola should be one that like everyone is going to be fairly similar with. And again, this is going to be a quadratic that has no transformations. It's a really bad quadratic. I apologize for that, but hopefully you can forgive me. So the main thing is like we say, all right, so what's, what is this graph now going to look like? If we're reflecting right about the x-axis, it's now going to like go down, right? And then we're going to shift it three units to the right and then one unit up. So all I simply need to do, and here's like the important thing I want you to pay attention to. When you're trans, when you're transforming like a parent graph or when you're applying the transformations, all you simply need to do is find one point and then apply that transformation to that one point. So for this example, uh, you know, I have my, my vertex is at zero, zero. So the only transformation that's going on are going the translation that's happening is a three units to the right and, and down negative one. So I need to go as three and so right, one, two, three, and then I need to go, is it, oh, that's an up one. What am I doing? It's a positive one. Jeez, be careful there. I almost made a mistake. So all I'm going to do is go right three. So one, two, three, and then up one. 
right? That is now going to be my vertex. And again, remember the graph is now going to be opening down, right? So it's going to look something like that. And voila, there we go. Now, the last thing that's going to come up um, quite a bit in, in conic sections is going to be simplifying radicals. Now, again, I mentioned earlier that a lot of times when we have a radical, um, we always want to see if we can simplify. We're not going to want to use our decimal approximation. The only time we want to use the decimal approximation is when we're going to want to be graphing it. But again, we're not usually going to write it down. It's just going to be helpful for us when we want to actually you know, plot the, what the graph is going to look like for the conic section. But in, um, in our case, I just want to kind of do a quick review of like, how do you simplify a radical? So let's go and take a look at an example. And the important thing is I want you to be able to do this quickly, right? So when we're simplifying radicals, if you remember when you were first learning how to do this, sometimes you use like a factor tree and we like, you know, did all this way to like, you know, explain this, you know, very thoroughly and stuff like that. Well, unfortunately in this case, like simplifying radical is going to be very kind of minor, right? You're just really simplifying the answer um, to, to kind of have a better idea of, you know, sometimes what the value is or to simplify, um, you know, either the final answer or to make your math a little bit easier. So the main thing we want to do when I'm trying to simplify a radical is I want to find the largest square number that evenly divides into 52. Now, sometimes what I like to do is start with the closest square number to 52, which again would be a 49. Obviously, 49 does not divide into a 52, nor would a 36, nor would a 25. Um, 16, that goes into 48, right? So that's not going to work. Nine is not going to work. Um, so therefore, what about a four? And actually, if you check a look, we know four goes into 40, right? And then that'd be plus 12. So yeah, we can rewrite this as a four times a 13. Now remember the rules of radicals say I can break that up into the square root of four times the square root of 13. Now the square root of four is going to be a two square root of 13. And now you are all set. 